O Roma Felix, O happy Rome, whom the most glorious blood forever consecrate while ages flow, thou thus empurpled art more beautiful than all that doth appear most beautiful now. Those are words taken from a hymn for the office of the Holy Apostles, St. Peter and St. Paul. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. There is a beautiful prayer that was composed by Pope Pius XI of holy and happy memory. The prayer is simply known as an act of consecration of the human race to the sacred heart of Jesus. It's a beautiful prayer, and it asks in simple form that those who are members of the church may truly acknowledge Christ as their king and that those who are somehow distant or outside of the kingdom of God may one day submit to the gentle rule of the Savior, including the Jewish people. The act of consecration written by Pope Pius XI reads, quote, Turn thy eyes of mercy towards the children of that race, once thy chosen people. Of old they call down upon themselves the blood of the Savior. May it now descend upon them as a laver of redemption. Unquote. Note that Pope Pius XI uses the adverb once, indicating that the Jews were at one time God's chosen people, but they ceased to be so when they rejected the Messiah who had been especially promised to their forefathers. Although the most important member of the church, Our Lady, as well as the foundational figures of the church, the apostles, were taken from this special race, because from this race came the Messiah, the majority of this people chose Barabbas, Herod, and Caesar, as opposed to the sweet yoke of Christ the King. And as a result of rejecting the mercy of God and the time of their visitation, the Jews, by and large, felt the severe effects of divine justice being rejected and cast off in punishment for their stubbornness and infidelity as they did not correspond to the many graces that were offered to them. The Jews were the chosen people of the promise of the Old Testament, but now Catholics are the chosen people of the fulfillment of that promise. The New Testament has replaced the Old. Reality has replaced the foreshadowing. Happy Rome has become the new Israel. The high ridge mountains of the old Jerusalem are no longer blessed by God, for the old Israel is no longer the people of God. Now the good Lord sits enthroned, especially in the new Jerusalem, the new Israel, the kingdom of God on earth, the church of Rome, with its seven hills and its seven sacraments. In the divine plan, the good Lord had made it known that the Gentiles, the pagans, would come to the faith. St. Paul wrote to the Romans the following, quote, But by the offense of the Jews, salvation has come to the Gentiles, unquote. Now let me give you just a little tidbit from history that demonstrates this switch of God's people from the Middle East to Rome. In the year 70 A.D., a Roman general named Titus defeated the Jews in a war. General Titus returned to Rome in triumph with the spoils of his victory. What he actually brought back to Rome from the Holy Land is carved in stone in a major monument in Rome called the Arch of Titus. Many scenes of the victory of the Romans over the Jews are carved, including the taking of the sacred menorah, the holy candelabra from the temple, as well as the golden table that held the showbread, the scene shows them being taken away from Jerusalem and brought to Rome. The temple books, or the Torah, were taken to Rome, as well as the veil of the temple 
all as spoils of victory. The special silver trumpets that called the Jews to prayer were also taken away from the Holy Land and brought to Rome. And finally, some of the marble and stone from the temple itself were brought to Rome too. For the Romans were always hungry for new building materials for their own structures. Our dear Lord had predicted that the Jewish temple would be completely destroyed with not one stone left upon another. For his people had rejected the time of their visitation. The Wailing Wall in Jerusalem today, where many Jews still pray, is not and never has been part of the temple itself. But what happened to some of the stones from that great temple of old? Well, archaeologists have determined that at least some of these stones were used to build a structure in Rome, a structure we call the Colosseum in the Eternal City. Yes, at one time the temple had been a place where sheep and bulls were sacrificed, but now some of these same stones were used to build an arena where early Catholic martyrs will be sacrificed. But as we know, the victory of Titus and the pagans of Rome was short-lived. A huge strategic error had been committed, for it would lead to the downfall of pagan Rome and the rise of Catholic Rome. All those great legions that struck fear into the inhabitants of the Mediterranean world and beyond were no match for Almighty God and his spiritual warriors who were the remnant of Israel. You see, soon a man of Jewish descent named Simon Bar-Jonah would come to the Eternal City. Yes, a man who would receive the name of Peter from the lips of Christ himself, as well as the keys to the kingdom, would come with other followers of the way, including St. Paul, to convert Rome and eventually the entire empire to the Catholic faith. Consider that whenever Peter is charged by our dear Lord with being the chief shepherd of the flock, it always happens near Roman locations. When Christ Jesus, for example, called Peter the rock upon which I will build my church, it was near the city of Caesarea Philippi, a Roman city in the Holy Land bearing the emperor's title. Also, our Savior charged Peter to feed the sheep three times at a place called Lake Tiberius, named after the Roman emperor of that time. The Son of God and Son of Mary had already planned from all eternity to conquer Rome all along. The generals who led the way of this conquering of Rome, the pillars of the faith, the foundational stones of Holy Mother Church were Saints Peter and Paul. St. Peter would die being crucified upside down. For if Jerusalem would have its Calvary, its Golgotha, so too Rome would have its own Calvary at Nero's Circus on Vatican Hill. And here Peter's body would be buried, and upon these holy relics would be built the great basilica that bears his name. Thus, ever greater meaning would be given to those sacred words, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will literally build my church. As for Paul, well, being a Roman citizen, he received a more dignified martyrdom of being beheaded. Since he had preached about the sword of truth, it was only appropriate that he would die by a sword. O Roma Felix, O happy Rome, this is Rome's great feast day. From the center of the Gentile world, from being the city of man, a pagan city of Babylon, that drank in the blood of the saints, Rome became the city of God and the new Jerusalem. Today of all days, let us remind ourselves all the more of our tie to Rome, that all Catholics must be Roman. 
In that creed, that holy creed, which we will sing in just a few moments, you will note that the ancient chant will emphasize that phrase, et unam sanctam catholicam et apostolicam ecclesiam. You know, at one time, the Church of Rome rarely, if ever, said the creed at Holy Mass. When the Pope was asked, why don't you say the creed that much, he responded, that since the Church of Rome had never fallen into heresy, as did the East, she did not need to recite the creed. But now we must know that we could easily and properly add an additional mark or a characteristic of the true Church to the creed, namely one holy, Catholic, apostolic, and Roman, yes, Roman Church. St. Maximus the Confessor, though Greek in regards to his language and culture, clearly said, but I am Roman in faith. This should be our claim as well. We may be American in food, in politics, in sports, in culture, but we ought to be Roman in faith. I am not, and you are not, American Catholics. We are Roman Catholics who happen to live in America. There is no such thing as the American Catholic Church. There is only the Roman Catholic Church. The Church of Rome is the brain, the heart of the universal church. The Church of Rome is the capital of the universal church. The Church of Rome is the cradle of the church. She is the mother church and all other local or particular churches are but daughters. In the early church, the great Arian heresy, which denied the divinity of Christ, gained many adherents. Those who fought against the horrible teachings of the Arians throughout the Christian world began to call themselves Roman Catholics in order to separate themselves from the heretics. Again, unlike the East, Rome has never officially fallen to error. Let us stand then with the Church Father, St. Augustine, who once stated, Roma locuta est, causa finita est. Yes, when Rome has officially spoken regarding the apostolic faith, the case is truly closed. And another phrase to remember on this special day is ubi petrus ibi ecclesia. Where there is Peter, there is the church. And both the holy relics of Peter, dear members of the mystical body of Christ, as well as the Petrine ministry are in Rome. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.